Welcome to Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman, the only show where a six-time New York Times best-selling author and world-renowned Bible scholar uncovers the many fascinating, little-known facts about the New Testament, the historical Jesus, and the rise of Christianity. I'm your host, Megan Lewis. Let's begin. Hello, and welcome back to Misquoting Jesus. The identification of Jesus as an apocalyptic prophet is probably a familiar one to many people listening, uh, but it's not one that's commonly made in modern churches. So today we're going to talk about this movement away from apocalypticism, when it started, how visible it is in Christianity's early record. And my final question to Bart, just a sneak preview for everyone listening, is going to be if apocalyptic preachers, modern doomsday preachers, are actually closer to Jesus' own original message uh, than the Christianity that we are more familiar with today. But before we get into that, Bart, how are you doing this week? Uh, yeah, I'm doing well. We're, um, we're in the middle of the semester and um, papers, are, uh, papers are coming in. And, um, you know, th there's, a big, there's a big deal on college campuses now about uh, uh, chatbots. <laughs> because uh, when chatbot GPT came out, everybody got really nervous about it. And it turns out they're justified in being nervous about it <laughs> because students, uh, you know, they're, they, they use it and some, some do. And so we're trying to devise ways to uh, defeat it <laughs> so that students actually come up with their own ideas. But I had this, I had this kind of funny thing that happened um, a few weeks ago. I was, I was doing a webinar with some, with a group of people and, and the person, a person wanted to, say what the topic would be, wanted to do a topic on uh, whether in the ancient world there were any uh, people who pretended to be the apostles for one reason or another. So apostolic uh, imposters. And I had never thought of that. You know, and I thought, wow, really? Oh, huh, that's interesting. So I thought about it and I, you know, worked and I gave this webinar where I talked about it. You're like, I, no, it doesn't seem likely. And I explained why and stuff. And so at the end of it, I asked the guy, I said, so why, um, where did you come up with this idea? Like, have you read that someplace? Like, has somebody said that before? He said, no, I hadn't read it someplace, but I just wondered about it. But see, I did, I did type it into a chatbot, a GBT, and they, and they said, and, the, and he read the answer to me, which was that, um, that there, are, there are some uh, New Testament scholars who uh, have maintained that uh, there were apostolic imposters. Uh, the the uh, major person to argue this is Bart Ehrman in his book. <laughs> so I went on and kind of listened to how I'd argued this in some book. I'd never even thought of it before. <laughs> And so, so the chatbot thing is, you know, like if you actually know the know like the stuff really well, you can still detect this stuff. I mean, I'm, it's going to get better, I know. But at this point, I tell my students, look, I'm going to know. <laughs> Let me see all right now. I'm going to know if you're using this stuff. <laughs> was it a book you'd actually written that was being referenced, or was uh, it? It was one of my books just... on forgery. Okay. <laughs> I, th I, th I think it's one of my books on forgery. And, and so, you know, it kind of makes sense. You know, you have people who claim to be uh, apostles when they're writing, but that's not an imposter in the sense that we were talking about where somebody actually like physically claims to be. And so, <laughs> yeah, I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> how how are you doing? Any imposters uh, for uh, Megan Lewis lately? No, no imposters, thankfully. Or at least if there are, I haven't come across them. Um, and I don't think I'm influential enough for people to want to impersonate me anyway, uh, unless they would like to also come to my house and help me organize my garage. That would be fantastic. If there are any Megan Lewis imposters out there, that's, that's what you need to be doing. I, I've heard you're revolutionizing the optician world. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing well too. <laughs> Thank you. I yeah. enjoy them. They make me yeah, happy. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, we should get into apocalypticism or de apocalypt. I can't say that word. De apocalypticism. There we go. I tell my students that if they want to pass the class, they need to be able to say de apocalypticization. <laughs> <laughs> de apocalypticization. Yeah, I don't, like I don't think I would have passed, but it's been, I think, probably about five minutes since we talked about apocalypticism uh, on the podcast. So it, it's been far too long. We need to absolutely yeah. get back to it. Right. And most of our audience is going to be very familiar with what it is. But could you take like maybe two minutes for those who are new to the show and explain what apocalypticism apocalypticism is <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so apocalypticism luckily is not an ancient world word it's one that scholars invented to uh to describe a phenomenon uh, especially in ancient judaism 
Um, the word apocalyptic itself, which is one that we use, or apocalypse, uh, the, wor the word apocalypse comes from a Greek word that means a revealing or an unveiling or a disclosure. And it's a revealing of, of in, in the Jewish circles that this emerged in, this view emerged in, it's a revealing of the secrets of the world that can make sense of it. And in Jewish apocalyptic thought, which started about 200 years before Jesus, uh, and is a view that Jesus himself held and John the Baptist held and his earliest followers held, the view is that this world, the reason there's so much awful, so many awful things happening in this world, why there's so much pain and suffering is because um, the powers who control this world right now are forces of evil that are opposed to God and opposed to his people, and in fact, opposed to most everybody, and they're making life miserable. And uh, God has allowed this to happen for some unknown reason, but the powers of evil are on the ascendancy, and things are getting worse and worse, and it's going to continue that way until God finally, uh, his, at his predetermined moment, intervenes to destroy everything that's evil and bring in a, a, a good world, uh, a utopian world world, a, a kingdom of God, uh, and that these apocalypticists uh, in the days of Jesus and before and after uh, thought that their world was just about as horrible as it could get and that the end was coming soon. And so the idea is that um, God is, that people who are faithful to God are going to be rewarded when this happens and those opposed to God will be punished. And so you need to be on God's side and you don't want to put it off because it could happen any day now. Uh, and so this is uh, this has long been argued to be one of the principal views of Jesus himself, and and of his uh, and of his followers in in line with John the Baptist and and uh, the people who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls and lots of other Jews at the time. So this is not something that modern churches really, well, many modern churches at least really talk about. I sat through many sermons, but none of them have really talked about the imminent end of the world and about this being Jesus' message. So there has clearly been a shift away from apocalypticism at some point in early Christian history. How soon after Jesus' death do we start to see this, this movement away from his more overt apocalyptic teachings? Yeah, um, it doesn't take too long. And, uh, and you're right, I mean, eventually, the apocalyptic says it never disappears. The, like, the, the idea that the world's coming to an end soon uh, doesn't disappear. In, in this book I wrote called Armageddon, uh, I show how this view maintained itself on, kind of on the margins until the end of the 19th century when once again it became big. And so uh, the churches that, that you know, you've been associated with or churches that, uh, that I was long associated with didn't have this message, you know, that the, the end's going to come next Thursday kind of thing. But there are some, obviously there are lots still do, as we're going to talk about later. So it, it um, our first Christian author uh, was the Apostle Paul. And um, he, uh, he wrote a number of letters that we have in the New Testament. And the ones that look like they're the earliest ones that he wrote, books like 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians, are books where he emphasizes it could happen any time now. You need to be ready for it. Uh, you need to be alert because the end's coming and you don't want to be caught out. You want to be ready for it. So be on your guard. Um, and so in the very earliest writings, we have that. But as time goes on, it starts shifting away uh, from that a little bit. Do we see a shift in Paul's own writings away from apocalypticism? And is this also reflected in the canonical gospels? Yeah, so it's an interesting it's an interesting question because um uh in later letters of Paul, he doesn't seem to be as convinced it's going to happen right away. Um when he writes First Thessalonians and First Corinthians, he he indicates that he's going to be alive when Jesus comes back and to bring the end of the world. Um, he talked about the, those who are dead in Christ will come to meet Jesus when he returns, and then we who are alive will also go and meet him, he says in First Thessalonians. So he seemed to think he's going to be alive at the time. But in later letters, like in uh, Philippians and Second Corinthians, he seems to think that he's going to die before it happens. Um, and he, he talked about uh, maybe dying first. And so it looks like he's uh, thinking maybe there'll be a bit of a delay here. And then when you get into letters that Paul did not write, but that are written by people claiming to be Paul, <laughs> the Deutero-Pauline letters, as scholars call them, the later letters, it's, this apocalyptic message pretty much um, uh, dissipates in a serious way, where, where it's not that the end is coming soon. There's going to be some time 
now. And there are later books of the New Testament that are quite explicit about it. The book of Second Peter, uh, for example, is written to explain why it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> and, and this is where uh, Peter, uh, the author of this book, who claims to be Peter, says that uh, people, uh, you know, the God, God delayed it so that more people will have time to repent. And you shouldn't say that God's gone back on, you know, his promise that it's going to happen soon. And this is where Second Peter says, because with the, the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And so what he means is, you know, if it's coming soon, that's by, you know, by God's calendar. It doesn't necessarily be by our calendar. And so when people, people quote me that verse sometimes to say, you know, why it's taken so long. And I say, yeah, yeah no, days of a thousand years, thousand years of a day. So if you tell me that, uh, you know, Jesus is coming back in three days, uh, we can start looking for him in uh, about uh, 2323. <laughs> in 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> or 3,000 years. Yeah, yeah, that's right, about 5,000. Yeah, so, right. Do you see in the canonical Gospels that um, try and, and preserve Jesus' actual teachings, do you see uh, like a shading of the apocalyptic message or um, people changing what is being said to try and make it more in line with this less imminent idea of the end of the world? Yeah, this is one of the really um, intriguing uh, aspects of the Gospels of the New Testament. Um, we, uh, we've said on earlier uh, podcasts that our three earliest Gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that they are, uh, they're called the synoptic Gospels because they're so much alike. You can put them in parallel columns and kind of read them next to each other. Um, but they have changes between them. Uh, and also, these Gospels had earlier sources of material. And so scholars talk, for example, about the Q source, which was a which is a source of Jesus' sayings that was available to Matthew and Luke, but uh, Mark didn't cite. So you've got Mark, who's probably our first gospel, and you have this Q thing that you can reconstruct from Matthew and Luke. Matthew has some of his own materials that were before him that he, he incorporates into his book, and Luke has some of his own materials he incorporates in his book, and so you call those M. Matthew's materials and L, Luke's materials. Okay, so I'm saying all that to, sh to say that the earliest sources of our, of the Synoptic Gospels, of our earliest Gospels, Mark, Q, M, and L, all of them are filled with apocalyptic predictions of Jesus, where Jesus is saying, uh, be ready, it's going to come soon, the Son of Man is soon to arrive, you know, he's going to come in judgment, you know, and you have these sayings about this happening. Um, and as time goes on, that apocalyptic message starts getting muted until by the end of the new, by the, by the final gospel, the gospel of John, it's, it, it virtually disappeared. John doesn't have this message. And, uh, and he's our last gospel. Jesus preaches about completely other things in the gospel of John. It doesn't talk about the coming kingdom of God and how you need to repent in preparation because it's almost here. Not in John at all. And it starts disappearing already in Luke our second to last gospel. And so what happens is the gospels start getting less and less apocalyptic. So they de-apocalypticize over time. They're getting rid of the apocalyptic message. In in the later non-canonical gospels, do we again see that same shift away from the apocalyptic message? Yeah, it even continues more. <laughs> and so the way, the way it works, if you map it out carefully, in, in uh, Matthew and Mark, you have this apocalyptic message uh, of Jesus. In Luke, Jesus starts modifying it. And so that he's not talking so much about the be ready because the kingdom is coming soon. It's more that the kingdom of God is here among us, you know, in my ministry. In Jesus' ministry, people start seeing the kingdom of God in Luke. It's still coming, but it's not as pressing of an issue. In John, as I said, it's virtually gone. It's not, you know, Jesus doesn't talk like that. When you get to the Gospel of Thomas, which is probably 30 years or so after John, where we, it's usually dated around the year 120 or so. I mean, it's debated, but around the year 120. So it's later still, you know, like nearly 100 years after Jesus had been saying the end was coming soon. In this gospel, Jesus preaches against an apocalyptic message. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus says, uh, look, don't wait for the kingdom of God. It's not coming. <laughs> the, the kingdom, people, people aren't going to say, look, there it is, or here it is. They're, the kingdom of God is spread out on the earth, and most people don't see it. And so the kingdom of God is not this thing that's going to happen in the future where evil is destroyed. It's somehow present. Uh, on, on the earth now. 
either like inside believers or among believers or something like that. Do you see when you're looking at the texts that shift away from apocalypticism, are they all shifting toward the same kind of idea or different teachings? Or does what they talk about instead vary from, from text to text? It varies from text to text. And um, throughout history and down till today, you have uh, different explanations, uh, you know, for why it didn't happen. And of course, a lot of Christians today would say, well, Jesus didn't predict it was going to happen. And so, you know, why, why should it happen? Uh, but it, it looks pretty clearly like in the early earliest gospel sources, he did predict it. And then as time goes on, people have to come up with explanations and you find different explanations, uh, both within the New Testament and then increasingly uh, later. So for example, the thing in Second Peter is that God's delayed it, uh, you know, so that people have a chance to repent. More commonly, people started saying that the kingdom of God is not, it's not some kind of utopian actual place here on earth. The kingdom of God is God's, uh, God ruling as king, and he rules as king in our lives. And so he, so we are the, we are the king, we have the kingdom of God within us, for example. By the time you get to about the, the, uh, the end of the fourth century, the early of the fifth, early fifth century, you start having uh, people uh, come up with an actual kind of conception of it, especially St. Augustine, who says that, in fact, the kingdom of God that was predicted is the church. Jesus uh, wasn't predicting some kind of, you know, wild, spectacular cosmic event where the earth would be destroyed or anything like that. He's talking about uh, the church was going to come. And so the kingdom of God is uh, is the Christian church on the planet. And that became that became the dominant view since Augustine, who's the great theologian of early Christianity, uh, pushed for it very uh, strenuously in his book, The, the, the City of God. Uh, that became the, the more or less the standard view among Christians down to the 19th century, that the kingdom of God is actually the church. So you said that apocalypticism never fully goes away. Do we see in early Christian heretical groups, people that stick with apocalypticism after the proto-Orthodox tradition has moved away from it? Yeah, it's interesting because you get you get various groups that take various stands on it. And um, there, um, you know, there are, there are all sorts of groups that are anti-apocalyptic. You know, the Gnostics, for example, tended to be anti-apocalyptic. Um, we'll, we'll talk about Gnosticism more. <laughs> We've done some already. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a topic that continually comes up. Uh, but there were groups, uh, and including uh, proto-Orthodox groups, that continued to think that uh, when Jesus said it's coming soon, he meant it, but he meant it for our day. And so um, there's, there was a group, for example, that was called the Montanists. Um, they're at the end of the second century. Uh, they're following a guy whose name just happens to be Montanus. And so they call them, they're called Montanists. And Montanus was a kind of a prophet. Uh, and he had two women who were his uh, colleagues who were also prophets. And they, uh, they were saying that the kingdom of God is soon uh, to come and it's going to arrive here at this village, <laughs> you know, they had this specificity about it coming soon. And there were people who, um, it, it was a large movement and people had a kind of, uh, expectation, eschatological apocalyptic expectation that it's coming soon based on these prophecies. And one of the interesting things is that this, this movement in part may have been responsible for, uh, Christians deciding, um, uh, which books would be in the New Testament, <laughs> weirdly. And the logic of it is, we'll get to it in some other episode, but the logic of it is that um, proto-Orthodox Christians wanted to insist you could not have new revelations from God to change the plan. <laughs> and so the plan is in the writings. And so this is when they start thinking serious about which writings are there, because we need, you know, we need, we need ancient apostles, because if you're saying that you can prophesy something, anybody can prophesy anything and say God told them so. So we need some written authorities here. And so that's part of the reason for the canon. So one of our, and we've, we've mentioned this before, one of our earlier podcast episodes was on modern end of world prophecies. Are these doomsday writers and preachers, do you think, more closely mimicking Jesus' own ministry than mainstream churches who may stick more with emphasizing the, the care of your fellow human aspect of Christianity? 
Yeah, boy, that's a tough question. And it's a, it's a really good one because one's always hesitant to say uh, the fundamentalists are the ones who are getting it right. <laughs> I mean, really? Um, in in some senses, though, uh, the the um, you know there is there's a big movement among fundamentalists of various stripes uh, to insist that the end is coming soon. This insistence has been around, uh, as I think we probably said earlier, uh, since the 1890s. The people who hold this view assume that it's always been around, uh, but it hasn't been. Uh, it's, a, it's a new formulation, and it is going back. Uh, you know, taking the teachings of Jesus literally in a sense. I say in a sense because Jesus appears to have thought that this was going to happen in his own generation. And they're saying it's going to happen in our own generation. And so it sounds like that's the same thing, but it's only the same thing in a sense because Jesus didn't mean 2,000 years later. So they're not taking Jesus literally. They're, they're transplanting him into their context. But in terms of their expectation that it's coming soon, uh, the answer is absolutely that it, that is what Jesus himself appears to have been saying. But in so many other ways, the 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 way Jesus phrased it and what Jesus thought about it is so radically different from what the fundamentalists today say. I mean, just kind of as one obvious example in the modern world, fundamentalists are very interested in, in major social and political issues. Um, including, uh, you know, I mean, everything from, you know, uh, Second Amendment rights to, uh, to issues that contain involving abortion and, you know, and prayer in school and whatever. Pick your, pick your topics. That, that is what you hear frequently. And they base these largely on this kind of passion and expectation that the end is coming soon and we need to shape up. And Jesus didn't take those kind of social and political stands at all. They, these were not the things he was interested in. So the very tenor of his ministry was hugely different. But this instance, insistence that the end's coming soon, yeah, that's, you know, that's what he said too. In, and in some, some modern settings, you see a kind of attempts to bring about the end of the world um, through, through one's own actions. Is that a more modern reaction to, to Jesus' preaching, or is this something that you also see in early Christianity as well? Uh, yeah, now this is an especially uh, intriguing question because um, when I talked about Jewish apocalypticism, I gave a very broad sketch of it. And even if you write a book on it, it's going to be, you're not going to be covering everything. But one of the important aspects of early Jewish apocalypticism is that different Jews had different expectations about how this was going to happen. And there were some Jews who, um, who thought, that this will be an intervention of God and it's got nothing to do with what we do. Um, this is, you know, we're not going to bring in this kingdom. Uh, God's going to do it because these powers of evil are far more powerful than us. And like, we're hopeless, helpless against them. God, God can overthrow them. And that was, that was the view of Jesus. Um, that's the view Jesus supports. He was not in support of violent opposition against the powers that be in order to in, initiate the kingdom. But there were plenty of other Jews who did think that. Uh, and that may have been driving a lot of what later came to be known as the zealots among the Jews. And it, it's the view that was held by at least, uh, at least uh, some of the Essenes who produced the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an entire scroll um, devoted to, it's called the War Scroll. It's about a, how the, uh, the children of light are going to actually do battle with the forces of darkness, and it'll be a 40-year war that they, that they win. And so there have been this tension within apocalyptic thinking from the very beginning um, about whether humans can initiate or inaugurate the kingdom or whether it's completely up to God to do it. And, um, and so the, the apocalyptic groups today, the fundamentalist groups, some of them, some of them just think, you know, we just have to sit back and let God do it. And it's all in God's, God's hands. Groups like that are also groups that notoriously are uh, opposed to um, any legislation in, in, involving the climate climate change, or they're either completely uninterested in issues about climate change or climate control because, um, you know, God's not going to let us blow ourselves off the planet. He's going to take care of it, you know, pretty soon. So why, why bother? But there are other groups of, um, of uh, conservative Christians who want to kind of urge it along. And a large part of that is what led to the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, the establishment of the state of Israel was was 
promoted uh, strenuously by conservative evangelical Christians in, in Britain and in America. And um, even today, there are um, there's big movements uh, among some fundamentalist groups for Israel, for example, to take over the Temple Mount again. Uh, the logic being that um, that uh, the Temple Mount that now is not under Israeli control is where the uh, it's where the Dome of the Rock is in Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock is built over where the Jerusalem Temple was, um, and according to the Book of Second Thessalonians. When the Antichrist appears on earth, he's going to go into the temple to declare himself God. Well, uh, for that to happen, there has to be a temple. And so there are fundamentalist groups that not only are pushing for Israel to take over the Temple Mount and want them to take over the Temple Mount, but are also collecting the materials, to have collected the materials to build the temple. Um, and this is, this is so that it can happen. We've got to do this so it can happen. And so that's really kind of pushing the matter and saying it's not going to be just God. You know, we've got to we've got to do this. So you mentioned a little earlier that de-apocalypticization de was kind of necessary to deal with the fact that the world didn't end when it was supposed to end. Jesus didn't come back within Paul's own lifetime. So that kind of answers the question of why the shift away. My question is, why do you think this modern shift back towards apocalypticism has happened? Uh, yeah, so that that ends up being a um, kind of a question about Western culture in many ways, and and how Western culture has moved um, for a variety of reasons. The I've mentioned several times that this this view started coming to prominence in the 1890s. It first appeared uh, in the 1830s, started to appear like where people started talking about it in the 1830s in England, with the beginning of this group called the Plymouth Brethren. And um, so, uh, so um, at this time in the 19th century, many Christians were being confronted with the realities of modernity, um, realizing that it's a big world out there, and there are a lot of people who don't believe like we do, not just kind of the pagan guy I got living next door, but like people off in other countries, and people became aware, more and more aware of other cultures um, on, a wide, on a wide scale. Um, and also uh, sciences were on the rise, and science was coming up with dangerous views, like the Earth was not 6,000 years old, and uh, we were not created as a human species uh, just you know, from dirt, but that, in fact, we descended from lower forms of primate that descended from so-and-so, and you go back, and it turns out the, world is, the Earth is very old, and we are evolved, and th these things contradict the Bible. Um, and so uh, some biblical theologians, again in England and in uh, Britain and in, in the U.S., uh, fought against that. And that's uh, as a kind of a counter move is when they developed the idea of the inerrancy of the Bible, that the Bible is inerrant in everything it says. Once you say that, you have the teachings of Jesus that says the end is coming soon. Um, so if it's inerrant, then the, te then the end is coming soon. <laughs> and so these people simultaneously um, became completely anti-scientific and became, um, and became uh, believers in the imminent end of the world. So they became apocalypticists. And that movement happened a long time ago. I mean, still in, in the modern era, but not, yeah. it wasn't two years ago. Why yeah. is it, do you think that um, apocalypticism in this sense has continued to be a viable theological ideal for so many Christians. If in, in early Christianity, the lack of an end of the world caused a shift away, why has a similar lack in modernity not caused a similar shift away? Yeah, well, of course it has for a lot of people, you know, people who are raised in fundamentalist circles often, you know, kind of see the light, and realize, yeah, no, it's not going to be like that. I just, I had a, um, I, I had a uh, informal office hour yesterday with a few of my students and uh, one of them started talking about how her mother was really freaked out by this movie in the 1970s called Thief in the Night. And anybody who's an evangelical in my generation knows the Thief in the Night. Every one of us saw it 20 times and how the hell scared out of us. I mean, it's like, oh my God, the rapture's going to happen and we're not ready, you know? And so it, it's about the rapture coming. Uh, 
And, uh, but, you know, almost every, you know, all of my friends who are evangelicals have that view and they don't have it anymore because they've seen the light. And so a lot of people see the light, but a lot of people also um, become convinced that the end is coming soon. And I think it is a completely a matter of the realities of modernity again. In my book, Armageddon, I sketch this um, and I try to explain how it happened. Um, there was apocalyptic thinking that happened uh, very seriously in fundamentalist churches through the 20s and 30s, but it really hit big time in 19, starting in 1945. Uh, once atomic bombs were dropped, people realized we really might be blowing ourselves off the planet. And so nuclear uh, exchange became a major reason for fundamentalists to think that the end was coming soon because it's clear during the Cold War, it could happen any day now. Um, and now people don't, they should feel that threat now, but most people aren't as worried about that as we were when I was a kid. Um, now, uh, for example, it's climate change. We really are going to destroy the planet. And um, people look at weather changes and things and they think, well, okay, it's a sign of the end. And so at every generation, you have, you have authors who write books showing indisputably that the prophecies now are being fulfilled and they look to this thing or that thing or the other thing. And um, you can say two things about these authors, by the way. There, there have been lots of them since, I mean, some of these people who were preaching this when I was a fundamentalist in the 1970s are still alive and still preaching it today. <laughs> and the two things you can say about every one of these authors is that, um, number one, they've all been proved to be indisputably wrong because they always, you know, they are, some of them actually pick dates. <laughs> well, that's a mistake. But, you know, it, back in the 70s when they said, well, I'm not going to pick a date, but it's going to be very, very soon. You know, <laughs> well, it hasn't happened. So they're all wrong. And the other thing is they've all made a lot of money, <laughs> which is kind of ironic for somebody who thinks the world's going to end, <laughs> that they're, you know, beefing up their bank account. <laughs> Well, I think we are going to stop there and take a brief break. Thank you very much, Bart. And after the break, we'll be back with some uh, news from Bart's World and then some listeners' questions. Have you ever wondered where the New Testament Gospels really came from? Were the books actually written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, as everyone seems to say? The answers to these questions may surprise you. In fact, what you discover may challenge everything you thought you knew about the Gospels. If you're ready to learn the historical truth, then you won't want to miss Bart Ehrman's free webinar, Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John? In this 50-minute talk with Q&A, you'll learn answers to some of the most intriguing questions surrounding the Gospels' authorship, such as, why did early Christians say the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John if they're anonymous? What's the best evidence that the Gospels were written by the Apostles? Were the Apostles of Jesus educated well enough to write books? And last, if the Apostles did not write the Gospels, who did? And where did they get their information? Don't miss your chance to uncover the truth behind the Gospels. Sign up now for free lifetime access to Did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John Actually Write Matthew, Mark, Luke and John at barterman.com forward slash authors. Thank you. And we're back with Bart's Weekly Update. This is Bart's Weekly Update, where we get to catch up on all the latest about Dr. Ehrman's book releases, speaking engagements, ehrmanblog.org happenings, and online course launches. Bart, what's going on with you this week? Yeah, well, um, you know, we uh, a few weeks ago we did this, uh, I guess a couple of weeks ago we did this um, this Bible conference uh, for my for the Barterman Professional Services thing. That this is called the New Insights in the New Testament, and we did this conference live, and people you know, can still buy it and stuff uh, on online. But um, now I'm moving on to the next thing uh, for this, which uh, is going to be a course I'm going to be doing in, um, uh, I guess, in about a month. Yeah, a month. Uh, it'll be on November 11th. And it's um, it's going to be on this topic that you and I have talked about and that I've published a book on. My book was called Misquoting Jesus. And it's about how scribes changed uh, their manuscripts of the New Testament. And I've never given a, uh, an extended course on this. 
Uh, well, except I, I used to teach a PhD seminar on it all the time. We would attend an entire semester reading ma Greek manuscripts and stuff like that. It was great. So we're not going to do that in my course. <laughs> I will not be requiring Greek, but uh, we're calling the course The Corruption of Scripture. And it will be dealing with how and why scribes who are copying their texts uh, change them. And I'll be bringing up stuff that I've never talked about before. You know, there, there's so much in this kind of topic. So I'll be I'll be dealing with things that um, that have been near and dear to me uh, since I was in college. These are issues I've been really interested in since I was in college, continue to be. And it, there's a lot to be said about it. And so there'll be a lot of stuff in there that, that uh, I think will be interesting to people who want to know, do we have the original Bible or not? That sounds fantastic and nice and detailed. I like mm. courses that have a lot you can sink your teeth into. Mm. And we also, um, just a quick reminder for people who are going to be joining us for our anniversary special, which is the next episode of this podcast, October 17th. We will be doing a live recording or a live stream on YouTube at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. Uh, it will be published as a podcast the week after for those who don't uh, watch on YouTube. This is primarily going to be a question and answer session and is your opportunity to ask your questions of Bart live. So we're asking you to please submit your questions by today. Today is the last day you can submit questions. Uh, there's a form on the website that's barterman.com forward slash ask Bart. And if you leave your email address in the form, then we will get back to you and let you know if your question has been selected and give you instructions for joining the stream on the 17th. So that I think is going to be an awful lot of fun. If you have a question, please get it in before the end of today. Otherwise, we will not be able to read it. And we're going to do some uh, questions from listeners. Speaking of audience Q&A. Now it's time for questions from listeners, where Bart answers real questions submitted by Misquoting Jesus fans. If you'd like to submit a question for future segments, please visit bartermancom slash ask Bart. Okay, we have some good questions this week. First up, was Jesus a vegetarian? He eats fish in some resurrection narratives, uh, but some people see these stories as later additions to the Gospels. Uh, I don't think those stories are later additions to the Gospels. Um, they, they're probably later stories. In other words, I think the, the Gospels had those stories originally when the Gospels were written, but they're stories that I don't think they're historical stories. Um, uh, so was Jesus a vegetarian? Um, well, um, that's kind of hard to answer because we we don't we don't really know. Um, the likelihood is, um, yeah, it's unlikely. Um, there were vegetarians in the ancient world sometimes. Um, the Pythagorean philosophers uh, and their followers were vegetarians because they believed in reincarnation, and they thought some of us get reincarnated as animals. So you don't want to eat, you know. A, piece of sirloin because it might be your great great grandfather <laughs> you know you just you, so you don't want to eat animals but um jews by and large were not some later some jews later became vegetarians because they were living in uh, gentile areas and they didn't want to eat meat because uh, it may have been meat offered to a pagan uh, god as a sacrifice and they didn't want anything to do with that but jews uh, annually for example celebrated the passover meal which involved eating a lamb. And um, I have no doubt that Jesus would have participated in that if there was a place where he could have a lamb. <laughs> they probably did up in Nazareth, I don't know. So I don't think, no, I don't think Jesus was a, was a vegetarian. Next question. Uh, I read a book recently that claimed Jesus taught reincarnation. And the book claimed that this teaching survived in the Bible in the story of Jesus calling John the Baptist Elijah. Uh, the book also cited the belief in incarnation uh, of many of Jesus' followers, including Clement of Alexandria and various Christian Gnostics. Do you think this is Jesus' teaching on the afterlife? And if not, then what were Jesus' views on the afterlife? Yeah, well, I wrote a book about this. <laughs> so I have a book called Heaven and Hell that addresses all of these questions uh, directly. I do not think Jesus himself believed in reincarnation. Jesus believed that uh, that an afterlife for individuals would come at the resurrection of the dead at the end of time. Uh, and it's not that you get reincarnated incarnated as as someone else. There were there were people who did hold to uh, a view of reincarnation. 
um, and um, uh, but uh, in in Jesus' day, but it was not a common uh, Christian view. It did become a, a, a marginal Christian view later on uh, in Christianity um, as Christianity spread a bit uh, by the early third century. We know of some who were who believed in reincarnation, but it, uh, but no, it, it was not ever a major doctrine, and I think it certainly was not the doctrine of Jesus. Thank you. Um, next one, since we only know about Jesus up until the age of 12 or 13, uh, apparently Matthew or Luke mentioned him, what do you think he was doing in the gap of time in the Gospels from then until he was 33? Some people have suggested he traveled east and studied Hinduism and Buddhism, but that seems unlikely. I know this is complete speculation. I'm just curious about your thoughts. Well, it's not complete speculation because um, we know about when and where he lived and what people were doing when and where he lived. And so um, the natural assumption is that he was doing what people did when, when and where he lived. Um, so uh, we know, you know, we know some things about what the Galilee was like in uh, in the twenties in the, uh, of the Common Era and before in the early part of the first century. So um, Jesus. Um, was apparently raised in the little hamlet of Nazareth, very small place, a few hundred people probably lived there. Um, it, for everybody there, it would have been a hand-to-mouth existence. Uh, people would have had farm plots uh, to raise food on, and there were probably some kind of barter system set up, and people would do various things in, on top of farming. Uh, Jesus' father apparently was somebody who would fix the local, you know, the gates and make the yokes and kind of work did kind of big style woodwork stuff. And so um, if that's what he did, Jesus probably learned how to do that. Um, so uh, people didn't travel much. Um, in fact, you know, it would be very rare, probably for many from, Na and from Nazareth, even, even to go to Jerusalem. Um, and so uh, the best guess is that Jesus just grew up as a, as a lower, lower class peasant in, in Nazareth. Somehow he, he, um, acquired knowledge, I think, of, of the Torah, uh, of the scriptures. And it may be that there was a local rabbi there, or uh, there was not a synagogue building there, but uh, archaeologists have determined. But, but you know, they got together probably for a Sabbath service and maybe had a scriptures, scripture for them to read. So I'm afraid it's rather unexciting. And it's not really as, as thrilling as, you know, Jesus went off to India and studied with the Brahmins. Um, those ideas, by the way, uh, about Jesus going off and traveling and, and all that, you can find them in, in gospel accounts. These are gospel accounts that were forged in the 19th century <laughs> and have been proved to be forged. And so, and I, but I have a chapter on them in my book, Forged. Uh, I have a chapter on these 19th century where people get this idea, you know, oh, maybe he went to Egypt and learned magic, you know, or maybe when he studied with the Brahmins. And, so, and there's like nothing, nothing, nothing to suggest anything like that at all. I, let me just say, for the answer to that, though, when I talk to my students about this, I say, you know, uh, you know, you wonder if Jesus was the son of God, you know, who could do miracles. Well, you know, was he on the Nazareth uh, baseball team? You know, and if so if he played shortstop, did he ever make an error? <laughs> and was he batting a thousand percent? You know, how did that work? <laughs> so there, there are, by the way, infancy gospels that do talk about Jesus as a, uh, as a young boy. Thank you. And our final question, in what way were the gospel writers influenced by the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70? Yeah, it's a, it's a big uh, interest for scholars and has long been an interest to scholars. The reason it's an interest uh, especially is because with the destruction of the temple in the year 70, Judaism uh, has to change in order to survive. Judaism cannot be a religion focused on worship in the temple as instructed in the Torah, the law of Moses. It cannot be a religion focused on sacrifices of animals because there are no more sacrifices of animals. And this begins a, uh, it begins a tremendous shift in the, uh, in Judaism, the Jewish religion worldwide that has come down to us today. So that every form of Judaism we have today descends from this post 70 experience of the destruction of the temple and the followers of Jesus, the first ones were Jews. And um, and all the Christians, you know, are accepting the Hebrew Bible and believe in the God of Israel, and and think that most Christians by the year seventy uh, who are not Jews think, well, most Jews have rejected. And so, how how does that affect 
the gospel stories. And we don't know for certain, uh, all, we obviously, we don't know all the ways it affected them. One thing is the gospels do uh, appear to presuppose and expect the destruction of the temple. Um, they're being written, the first gospels are written right around the time, after just after the time the temple was destroyed. That's Mark. The others are written later. They they show that they know that the temple's been destroyed. Um, and um, various people have different interpretations of this. One is that the gospel writers are trying to show that um, that Jesus now is the new way, that the temple's been destroyed, and so Jesus is the way to God. And that may be why, for example, when Jesus dies, um, the curtain in the temple is ripped in half so that you don't need the temple to have access to God. Jesus provides you with access to God. And so this may have been part of the business of uh, Christians understanding that they have superseded uh, Jews as the people of God. Uh, and so it could have, you know, that has rather drastic implications about Jewish Christian relations, but also about Christian self identity as the new Jews, you know, the new chosen people, which not everybody had, but, but some did because of that. Thank you very much, Bart. We're going to wrap up here. But before we finish for the week, would you mind summarizing what we talked about and let people know where they can find out more? Yeah, so we've been talking about how the Gospels um, of the uh, New Testament and the rest of the New Testament and then later Christianity came to de-apocalypticize Jesus. Um, Jesus himself maintained that uh, the world uh, was at near its end, the world that he knew, the history as he knew it, and that uh, it was it had grown in uh, evil and wickedness so much that God was soon going to intervene and bring in a good kingdom on earth and that it would happen within his own generation. That didn't happen, and so then Christians had to deal with it. Uh, why would Jesus say it's going to happen soon if it didn't? And um, various ways of dealing with that can be found within the New Testament and then certainly after it, where some Christian thinkers and authors say that Jesus didn't really mean literally it's going to end. He meant something maybe metaphorical, or he meant it, but God has now uh, decided to uh, wait a while so people can repent, or maybe he meant the kingdom of God was going to be something not that was going to come in the future, but something that would be within us. And so people had different exp expectations. But by and large, the, the tradition got de-apocalypticized. There continued to be apocalyptic groups uh, on the margins of Christianity throughout most of history. But then the apocalypse movement roared back at the end of the 19th century and is still with us today in various forms of fundamentalist Christianity. Thank you. And uh, which of your books should people read for more information on this? Uh, probably the one where I deal with this the most is my book, Apocalypse. Um, I mean, I'm not called, called Apocalypse, it's called Armageddon, uh, what the Bible really says about the end, where I talk about uh, Jesus as an apocalypticist, but also talk about how um, people started shifting his message. And I talk about, you know, the book of Revelation and its view. Of, uh, of apocalypticism and how, how that ends up getting interpreted through the ages as people become less apocalyptic. Thank you so much. Audience, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe to the podcast and make sure you don't miss future episodes. Remember, you can use the code MJPODCAST for a discount on all of Bart's courses over at www.bartehrman.com. Misquoting Jesus will be back next week. Bart, what are we doing next time? Next time we have a special edition. We uh, this is uh, this will be our one year anniversary. Uh, so uh, we're very happy about that. We love how this podcast has gone, uh, and it's been a lot of fun uh, with Megan <laughs> to do this. And, I'm having a great time. Uh, Good. I'm glad because I, I certainly am too. So we're going to have a special edition. It's going to be a live edition. Uh, it'll be eight o'clock on October seventeenth. Uh, and um, I'm going to be taking live questions. People will be submitting these questions, but have to do it by the end of today, as Megan said earlier. But we're going to pick out uh, pick out questions, and people will actually ask the questions themselves. And so I'll be interacting with those uh, during, during that during our anniversary podcast. I hope we will see you all next week. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. This has been an episode of Misquoting Jesus with Bart Ehrman. We'll be back with a new episode next Tuesday, so please be sure to subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcast listening app or on Bart Ehrman's YouTube channel so you don't miss out. From Bart Ehrman and myself, Megan Lewis, thank you for joining us. <laughs>